from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is U.S. Farm Report. The smell of grilled cheese, a plethora of places to grab ice cream, and barn after barn full of cows. It can only mean one thing. We're bringing you the show from the World Dairy Expo here in Madison, Wisconsin. And here's what's in store over the next 60 minutes. Milk prices have been in the dumps, but is optimism starting to pour in? I think we've certainly come off the, the worst of it. Plus, as basis tanks, what's the outlook for grain prices? We ask our economists this week. Dairy farmers are all about productivity and efficiency. That will take all of our manure and local food waste, and we'll use that to make natural gas, or renewable natural gas. Michelle Rook takes us across the country to see how two dairy producers' sustainability efforts start with their soil. How a devastating loss for one dairy family turned into a gift of generosity and support. She was one of the kindest people that anybody had ever met, uh, truly genuine. She loved youth and the World Dairy Expo show ring, and that's where the Ostroms are now giving back in a remarkable way. And in John's world. What's going on with milk sales? Now for the news, it has been a wild week in Washington. First, a government shutdown is averted, and then the House making history by voting to remove Kevin McCarthy as House Speaker. Bringing congressional business to a halt, including the Farm Bill, which is a big topic of discussion here at World Dairy Expo. The current interim speaker can perform limited functions, but legislation cannot move. And with a new deadline to fund the federal government a little more than six weeks away, many are now concerned about what Congress can get done in that time frame. And Jim Mulhern, current CEO of National Milk Producers Federation, telling us really now all bets are off when it comes to timing of the Farm Bill. I think the biggest hurdle right now is getting the Farm Bill done at all. Um, we've seen you know, the activity in the Congress this week, in the House in particular this week, the loss of a speaker. I think that pushes the Farm Bill into next year. We're not going to see a 2023 Farm Bill at this point. It likely is going to be 2024 at the earliest. Well, hot and dry weather, that is continuing to push harvest to forward at a faster pace. Right now, 23% of the nation's corn crop has been harvested, two points ahead of average. As for soybeans, 23% harvested there, one point ahead of the five-year average. We have a couple of states that saw a 20 percentage point change in maturity from the previous week. And that's where the hot, dry weather built in late in the week in the Dakotas. We saw a big jump in maturity in North Dakota from 51 to 73 percent during the week ending October 1st. And in South Dakota, a big jump from 60 to 80 percent. And the 2023 harvest is speeding along in Illinois with cooperative weather, as we found this week on our I-80 harvest tour. Our early beans were awfully good this year. Uh, we're talking some 80s. Where the yield is coming from in the end, I don't know, but we got off to a really good start with our planting this year, and despite the lack of a lot of rain, we're coming out with one heck of a crop. Kirk says test weights are off slightly compared to prior years due to that short grain fill period as the heat pushed the crop to maturity there. And the issues along the Mississippi River are growing as the river levels continue to drop. Portions of the major waterway have now gone weeks with little to no rain, and it's causing the barge rates to increase. Take a look at just one gauge reading in Arkansas City. The blue line there, that is the current river level. The green line way above it represents nor normal water levels. And that red line there, that is record low levels. And look at the river in St. Louis. The river usually hits its lowest point between November and the start of the year, but it's already hitting critically low levels right now. As of the start of September, barge rates had already increased to $30 per ton, and this could impact farmers' bottom line as well, as basis has really widened again in areas near the river. Well, slumping crop prices and high production costs continue to erode farmer sentiment. That's the headline from the latest ag economy barometer from Purdue University and the CME. The September barometer fell nine points to 106. Farmers surveyed say beyond softening prices and input costs, interest rates, those are a growing concern. The index of both current conditions and the future expectations were lower in September as well. All three indices, those were below a year ago, as farmers continue to question whether now is a good time to spend money on big projects. All right, that's it for the news. Well, it was extremely hot to start World Dairy Expo this week, but it finally is starting to feel like fall after a major cool down 
blanketed much of the country this week. We'll have a check of weather coming up next. The I-80 Harvest Tour on U.S. Farm Report is brought to you by Case IH. The Farm All has been an iconic partner on the farm for generations. Come celebrate a century of Farm All. The one for all with us at farmall100.com. And by AGI. At AGI, we spend a lot of time focused on product details, making sure you can store your grain how you need to and move it when you need to. Learn more at aggrowth.com. U.S. Farm Report weather is brought to you by H&S Manufacturing. The PS6180 Power Spread Live Bottom Vertical Beater Manure Spreader is the heaviest built spreader in its size. This manure spreader has a 793 cubic foot heaped capacity and includes 3 quarter inch grade 80 marine log chain and removable vertical beater assembly with 3 quarter inch flighting and replaceable blades. Find out more at the H&S website. Well, time now for a check of weather. Meteorologist Matt Engelbrecht joining us this weekend. Matt, a major cool down for much of the country this week. I mean, it's starting to actually feel like fall. So is this just a seasonal cool down or are we starting to see more of an impact from El Nino just yet? Yeah, we're seeing uh, kind of those uh, the big swings in our temperatures, what you'd expect with fall transition from a summer to winter, not so much connected to El Nino. I, I think we start to see the impacts from El Nino starting to show up in uh, kind of the water content of the atmosphere as we continue to bring in a lot more water with some of these systems uh, as they come through the United States and deeper into winter is when we'll talk more about El Nino and the possible impacts from that. As of right now, they're looking at uh, between October 10th and October 14th. So time's asking uh, about you know, where we go from here regarding the temperatures. Uh, we cool down and we keep that cool air around the Midwest through October 14th, but back here towards the West, another ridge will start to build and that is classic pattern uh, for October as you got a trough followed by a ridge followed by a trough followed by a ridge. So you got the cooler air coming through, if not colder air and then warmer air back in behind it. Now it's in between the two that will start to see not only rain chances, but also talking more about colder air and first frosts and freezes, those kind of situations, the deeper we get into October. So what that looks like from a jet stream standpoint, this entire weekend, it's been about uh, this trough, the U uh, in the atmosphere that is supporting uh, this colder, drier air in portions uh, of the northeast. The ridge isn't going to be strong enough to really push this trough out, so it's going to kind of push itself back around, leading to kind of a long-term trend of cooler than average temperatures. That's why in that map that we just looked at, I didn't see much warming going on for two thirds of the United States because of this trough. But there is going to be some ridging back out to the west, which will bring those temperatures back up as we continue to look into the late stages of the work week and the weekend. Kind of start to get a little bit more zonal, especially back down here to the south. So don't anticipate any big swings in temperatures back into the southeast to Texas, Oklahoma, or even on the west coast. That's going to have to wait until possibly this weekend as things start to shift around. So what does that look like in terms of precipitation? October 10th and 14th, I have to say this long word because snow is starting to show up in some of the models, some of the data. Now, October 10th through the 14th, uh, wet pattern setting up through the southeast where that zonal pattern uh, sets up is also a place where we're going to look at some rain showers, possibly some thunderstorms continuing to fire. There's a look at the precipitation outlook through the 14th. Thanks, Matt. Well, dairy markets have been a bit of a damper on the ag economy this year, but butter prices hit an all time high this week. So will that spill over into other milk markets? Plus what to watch in USDA's grain report next week. Dan Bossy, Ben Lane and Kate Burgess join us from World Dairy Expo next. Welcome back to US Farm Report here from the 56th annual World Dairy Expo excited to be broadcasting here. Dan Bossy, Katie Burgess, as well as Ben Lane joining us this weekend. Ben, I'll start with you because, I mean, when you look at the milk markets, it has definitely been a sore spot in the ag industry this year. We look at how many times DMC payments have been triggered every single month. Is there light at the end of the tunnel? Do you think we are going to see some more momentum in these milk bar markets? I think we've certainly come off the, the worst of it. It was a really tough year. Uh, I think we expected a little bit of weakness compared to how good last year had been, but we didn't quite expect it to fall to the to the depths that it did. Luckily, I think that was pretty short-lived, and 
we're going to see a little more shakiness still, but I think we're off the worst of it. And as we move into next year, I think these price levels still aren't quite great, but if we can see feed costs and some of the other costs come down, that'll help margins and uh, help profitability. So it'll feel a little better. Even if we don't see milk prices get back to where some of the highs that we had seen, it's going to feel a lot better than it than it does right now and than it has this year. Well, Taylor Leach from our dairy team, she said, you know, Todd, I keep hearing from producers this week that they just talk about these hidden costs, all these costs that are coming up, and that's really eating away at margins. So when you look at the forecast for milk prices, Katie, I mean, as we head into 2024, what is your thoughts? As we're looking to 2024, I think we're going to see a divergence between class four and class three prices. Right now, for folks that live in areas where they make a lot of butter and powder, those prices are looking quite a bit better for folks that are primarily paid on cheese. And you're right. There are costs that people are looking at, you know, general inflation, pay more for labor. Interest rate has been a big talking point here over the past few months. And so I think producers need to look carefully at what their input costs are going to be for this year. And then look at ways to manage risk because, as Ben said, we think prices will be higher next year than they were this year, but it's never for certain. How big of an impact is inflation having on, on, on the size of the dairy herd as well as possible rebuilding of the beef herd, Dan? Well, if you think about the year ahead, inflation has had its impact, there's no doubt, but I still would coin 2024 the year of protein. I say that because we look at whether it's chicken or pork or beef, and I believe dairy protein will be included in that, it's going to be relatively strong. So we've had the years of crops, which were several years ago. We think we're now moving into the years of protein. And so uh, the beef market in particular is supposed to make record highs next year, which again, gives it an avenue for our cull cows and some other opportunities in terms of using a dairy animal to at least get a black calf on the ground. Yeah, so beef on dairy, you mentioned that. How long do you think dairy producers will be able to capitalize on beef on dairy and these extremely high beef prices? So our problem is, as we model out the beef herd, we do not see, we see models for expansion today as we call, keep back some cows, but the beef herd has a long, the beef cow herd has a long ways to go. So if I think about it, this is three to four years at a minimum. We are still not retaining heifers to a big degree that gives us the opportunity to really accelerate beef production anytime soon. Speaking of strong butter prices, I know Katie mentioned it, but butter hitting an all-time high this week. What is driving that? Demand has just been great. Domestic demand has been strong for butter. So I think we're getting to that time of year where retailers start getting concerned about, are we going to have enough butter for the holiday season? That's the big demand part of the year. So I think you get that, that nervousness. You've got good demand already through this year and relatively low inventories. Plus, as we start making more cheese, we're pulling some of that milk that would have otherwise been going into butter powder plants in class four is now not quite available as, as much as it had been. Katie, one thing we haven't talked about is, you know, the potential government shutdown that we saw that that was averted. But as we see some historic things take place on the Capitol, especially in the House with the leadership, kind of seems like maybe that a government shutdown is still looming with that November deadline. What impact would that have on DMC and some of those other payments? Yes. So we averted it this week. But one thing we're carefully watching. If the government shuts down, it's possible that crop insurance programs could be shut down also. It looks like this go around, they were trying to figure out if there's a way to keep it open, but I think we won't know that until we know what happens in November. And with that, it also means that potentially there's a pause on DMC payment. Yeah. All right. Well, the government didn't shut down. That means we will still have our October 12th grain report as well. So when we come back, we will also later on the show, we want to talk about grain prices and feed prices and kind of where we're heading with those. We need to take a quick break and then we'll be back with much more U.S. Farm Report in just a moment. U.S. Farm Report brought to you by World Dairy Expo, where the global dairy industry meets. Mark your calendars for the 2024 event. Tuesday, October 1st through Friday, October 4th, 2024 in Madison, Wisconsin. Learn more at worlddairyexpo.com. Well, here at World Dairy Expo, there's plenty of dairy being consumed this week. I mentioned it earlier, the famous World Dairy Expo grilled cheese from the University of Wisconsin, as well as ice cream galore. I mean, it is heaven. But how has dairy demand changed over the years? Here's John Phipps. There are very few economic trends that show up as near perfect geometric forms over several years. 
Fluid milk consumption is one of them. Since 1979 until 2019, fluid milk consumed per person has declined steadily with almost mathematical precision. At the same time, total milk equivalent consumption per person has stayed virtually flat. All the milk that wasn't going on cereal was going on pizzas in the form of cheese, in a remarkable and somewhat inexplicable coincidence. There have been many words published to explain both phenomena, but despite the reasons offered, there is no indication this pattern won't persist into the future. From the decline of cereal for breakfast to the surprising failure of well-known marketing programs like Got Milk, fluid milk consumption seems locked onto one trajectory. For milk producers, such results are sobering. But it points out that milk production economics are not driven by just ordinary market forces so much as government milk programs and pricing policy. These too seem firmly established regardless of endless debate over their effectiveness and cost. Recently, though, I ran across a desperately needed new and puzzling milk consumption wrinkle, just in time to prevent discussing the same consumption data for the nth time. The battle between reduced fat, 2%, and whole milk. Most experts attribute this reversal as consumer reevaluation of the health benefits and risks of milk fat. I can go along with that, but my guess is this new perception of milk fat has increased butter consumption. My theory, which I may have borrowed from other observers, is the mildly astonishing success of cooking shows on TV and social media has lifted the culinary importance of cooking with butter. Starting way back with the late Julia Child, celebrity chefs not only use butter for cooking, they use a lot of it. Still, this is one dairy chart with unexpected trends and a little mystery. Like what happened around 2005 to elevate reduced fat milk? Why is low fat skim milk declining? Why have flavored milks plateaued? It's tough to find much excitement or unfortunately optimism in the future of fluid milk sales, but the fickleness of consumers is at least trying to provide a little drama. Thanks, John. Well, for one family in Ohio, they name all their tractors after the person that they bought it from. And the one that we're gonna show you next, it will blow your mind if you are an Alice Chalmers fanatic. That's Tractor Tales next. U.S. Farm Report is brought to you by Brandt, technology-driven nutrition that feeds your crop. Got equipment to sell privately but tired of scams and hassles? Visit MachineRepeat.com and click Sell Mine. MachineRepeat.com, the simple and secure way to buy and sell equipment online. Hey folks, it's Tractor Tales time and we are headed to Ohio to check out a very special Alice Chalmers B that has some unique homemade parts that have special meaning for the owner. We bought this tractor five years ago at auction from a gentleman here in the neighborhood. He was a educator for life, auto body, run vocational school. He was a personal necessity. If he needed it, he wasn't going to go buy it. He built it. He passed away at the ripe old age of 93, and his actual name was Milton Miller. So it was Mil Donna and Milton Miller, and everybody called him Gus, so this is Gus. And Gus is very hard to get on and off of with his little sun canopy because he didn't like the sun. It is just something I had to have because of who he was, and it's only um, four miles maybe from here to there, so it was another neighborhood tractor. I'm assuming Gus wanted a front end loader, so he built one. I remember seeing him out driving around this little thing in his yard, and I had no idea how modified this little tractor was till we went to the auction. He's got some sort of rear lift with cylinders. There's valves that move from the loader to the rear cylinder, you know, without having a whole lot of extra done to it. It is quite the little chore to drive. There's no brakes because he didn't believe in them. And that is one thing we will do is put brakes on it. I was going to restart when I got it and I got to look at what, it, what he had done. There's no way I'm changing this. This, this thing is a relic and it is a 
a testament to him. So it, it is, it will stay how it is. For dairy farmers, it's all about efficiency and productivity when it comes to milk. And that all starts with the feed. Up next, we're off to Virginia as well as South Dakota to meet two dairy farmers who have learned that it all starts with the soil. So how? Michelle Rook, she shows us next. U.S. Farm Report is produced and distributed by Farm Journal Broadcast. Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report. Trusted, timely, tradition. Welcome back. Well, the U.S. dairy industry was an early leader in sustainability and lowering the cow's carbon footprint. Michelle Rook this weekend looks at how this is also helping these operations to flip their soil to achieve higher yields in the fields. U.S. dairy operations continue to make great strides when it comes to sustainability, but they've always used regenerative practices. For instance, this cornfield was cut for silage. Now the cow manure will be recycled, put on this land to replenish crop nutrients and improve soil health. Dairies like Modak Dairy in South Dakota produce hundreds of thousands of gallons of manure annually and view it as a real value for their operation. We spend $50,000 a year on commercial fertilizer. The rest is all, this through, goes through the cattle and comes back, back out as a, as a byproduct, for, which is a, uh, a good product for the land and everything else. Moe says dairy manure also promotes soil health through increased biological activity and organic matter in the soil. To me, it makes the land more mellow and more, more uh, fertile and it holds the moisture a lot better and stuff because of the fertility. At Cool Lawns Farm in Virginia, dairy producer Ben Smith says they manage manure on every inch of their field as part of their nutrient management plans. We soil test every, every year or every other year. Depending on the field and the crop rotation, we grid sample everything, even pasture and hay ground we grid sample because we want to put those nutrients exactly where they need to be. And, and furthermore, they're expensive. So we don't want to just do a blanket application. We want to put them where they need to be. And when properly managed, manure also results in higher crop production. We got land that's further away that we can't put the manure on. It's 10, 12 miles away that we use commercial fertilizer on. And we don't get the yields and we don't have the, the soil condition, I should say. Smith says dairy producers are the original upcyclers, taking manure, which was once considered a waste product, and turning it into an asset. It is a valuable product because anything that we can use as a fertilizer, as a bedding, as a product that can produce energy, I mean, it's, that's just three things off the top of my head that makes manure uh, value added. The newest value comes from turning that manure into energy. We're putting in a methane digester, um, and that's to come here in the next 12 to 24 months, but that will take all of our manure and local food waste and we'll use that to make natural gas, or renewable natural gas. In addition, dairy producers like Smith are improving soil health by integrating cover crops on nearly every acre. Everything behind corn silage, we drill uh, rye or triticale. Sometimes we'll incorporate radishes, or cl radishes, clover, turnips, everything over our standing grain crops because they don't get harvested till later in the year. We fly on in September with a plane or helicopter, uh, rye, triticale, clover, uh, vetch. We want everything to have a cover crop on it uh, all winter long to prevent runoff, to prevent soil erosion, to permit, prevent nutrient uh, leaching. Those cover crops can also be grazed, which sequesters carbon and breaks down crop residue. And it's through all of these regenerative practices that dairy operations can not only flip their soil, but be part of the solution to climate change. I'm Michelle Rook for U.S. Farm Report. Thanks, Michelle. Well, when you look at what's happened with the U.S. dollar, it has been on an impressive run. So how is that eating into the outlook for some exports? We'll talk about it with our marketing roundtable from right here at World Dairy Expo next. Flip Your Soil on U.S. Farm Report is brought to you by Nutrien Economics. Expert advice when you need it. Learn more at Nutrien-Economics-with-a-K.com.
Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report here from World Dairy Expo. Dan, let's get into grain and feed prices a little bit. No government shutdown. That means we will have the October 12th report. We did see USDA adjust yields in this last re- in, yep. in the September report. Do you think that trend continues? And kind of what is your forecast for grain prices right now? So we, we believe in the uh, upcoming report next Friday, they'll cut another bushel or two from the corn yield, maybe a bushel from soybean yield. We're thinking about a 171, 172 U.S. corn yield, a 49 bean yield. Uh, the group three beans are really getting hit because of the dryness in September. Those are the beans that mature later. So, you know, I think that the be- the corn and bean markets are getting close to some seasonal lows. They normally happen around Columbus Day. And then as we start to think about the market longer term, we pivot our attention to South American weather, which is abnormal, at least today. Argentina is going through a third year of drought. Australia's got problems, too much rain in southern Brazil. My Brazilian office is already hearing farm complaints about what's occurring, uh, at least uh, with the early seeding. So we're worried about South America. That may give the market a bump. And for farmers, that would be good because revenue insurance is all dictated by the month of October. If prices stay low for another few weeks, we get bigger checks as farmers and then start to rally the market maybe in early September, early November. Another thing we're watching is this U.S. dollar and the strength in the U.S. dollar. And Ben, why are we seeing so much strength right now? And are we seeing that impact our U.S. agricultural exports? We are on the dairy side. That's been a that's been a big impact. Is the stronger dollar does make it more expensive to to buy U.S. dairy products and other other dairy products really that are, that are priced in the U.S. dollar. But it does start to slow that down, and we've seen. Exports have become increasingly important. In a year like 2022, we have a lot to thank for the exports that help drive those prices so high. So in years where we don't see as much competitiveness in terms of global prices, and we have a strong dollar that's a little bit of an additional headwind, years like this, we're starting to see the downside. Now, I think that long term, there's still a positive story in global demand and our ability to serve that. But in the meantime, things like currency fluctuations and and prices around the world do tend to put us in and out of those markets and add to some volatility that I think is just going to be a fact of life as we as we become a bigger player in the export markets. Katie, you mentioned that there may be some positives moving forward when it comes to exports in these export markets. Well, what are some of those potentially? Yes, I think the future for the U.S. dairy industry is very bright. And the reason for that is when we look at the other main dairy suppliers around the world, um, that being Europe and New Zealand, in those countries, they're facing environmental restriction. And so it does not seem like they are going to be able to grow their dairy industries in any big extent. But in the long run, we do still expect demand for dairy products to grow. So I think the U.S. is going to be best positioned to serve those markets. Um, But as Ben was talking about, there are going to be some ups and downs along the way. So even though this year exports have been choppy, in the long run, I think there's a lot of opportunity there for the U.S. market. Yeah, mention the volatility. Something else we've been talking about on the show and, and something that economists had mentioned is possibly us seeing a deglobalization when it comes uh, uh, around the world. Are we starting to see that? And what protein or what sector do you think that could hit the most, Dan? So deglobalization means that we're regionalizing trade, I guess, is the way we're talking about it, or, or production. And I think if you look at the BRIC countries and some of the other formations that have been happening recently, that has been occurring. You know, we'd like to see way demand kicking up, our primary problem being China. So I need the Chinese to buy less of Brazilian or South American product or maybe down in New Zealand or our friends down in Australia. I need them to come back here. Hopefully the U.S. can uh, politically make some progress. But I am worried about what you talked about, which is regional hubs forming and the U.S. dominance in terms of global egg trade being diminished. Well, thank you all for joining us from World Dairy Expo. We appreciate it. Stay with us. We have much more from U.S. Farm Report when we come back. U.S. Farm Report brought to you by World Dairy Expo, where the global dairy industry meets. Mark your calendars for the 2024 event, Tuesday, October 1st through Friday, October 4th, 2024 in Madison, Wisconsin. Learn more at worlddairyexpo.com. Well, step into the Coliseum behind me and you'll see hard work, grit, and showmanship on full display. It's really a highlight of World Dairy Expo here and it involves people of all ages. For one family though, they wanted to fuel those efforts from youth, creating a legacy for future leaders. You know, she was one of the kindest people that anybody had ever met, Uh, truly genuine. Annette Ostrom was one of life's true treasures. 
whether you knew her for five minutes or five years, I got a front row seat to that, truly kind. And I can tell you when nobody was looking, she was the exact same way. Jim says his wife, Annette, loved World Dairy Expo. Well, Annette absolutely loved showing cattle. Uh, she, her whole goal when you're out in the, in the ring is to get that cow or that heifer to be completely comfortable so that they can look their best. But even more than Expo, she adored the youth. She was one of those people that could tell you the ages of the kids running around the grounds. You, you know, at, at the show, she can tell you where they placed. And she, uh, kids and youth in our industry has been very special to her. Jim says his wife was healthy, happy, and simply loving life. But in February of 2022, something just wasn't right. We were walking down the beach uh, on vacation and she complained of a backache. Not able to get into her family doctor, they called a family friend. By noon on Monday, we had a diagnosis and it was terminal. A battle with cancer that Jim says was intense. Yet just eight months after that diagnosis, when World Dairy Expo happened, she insisted that that's where she wanted to be. Last year, she wanted to be here to see Tristan show and she walked into World Dairy Expo carrying a bag like anybody would and she left in a wheelchair. Their son, Tristan, was 14 at the time. It was hard. It was hard for her to be here, but she did it. And I said to her, we should go home. And she said, this is where we belong and this is where we're staying. And so we stayed here. That's how important it was to her. In less than two weeks after World Dairy Expo last year, Annette passed away. Grieving from such a loss, Jim had already started the process to keep Annette's memory alive the best way he knew how. We decided to do through that process was to uh, sponsor a showmanship contest here at World Dairy Expo. And the showmanship contest, they have Supreme Champion, uh, they have Brand Champions and Supreme Champion of all breeds here, but they didn't have a Supreme Champion showman in the youth program. So with that, the Osterms put together a 10-year sponsorship of a youth showmanship contest in honor of Annette. I told her about it. It's the Annette Ostrom Memorial Supreme Champion trophy. She was the kind of person that would never, ever want something named after her. She warmed up to the idea, and we've got a 10-year commitment to it, but it's really our goal is to do it forever. Last Sunday, as youth entered the ring, emotions were fragile. It was very difficult, uh, but it's also so rewarding knowing that we're doing something that recognizes somebody who truly loved the youth of our industry and wanted to support them. And that's when the support poured in as the showmanship winners were selected. I want to say cleansing, but a, a helpful experience, healing experience for our our family um, and uh, Tristan and, and my daughter Shelby were standing next to me and it, it was uh, really some very special moments. Special moments for not just the Ostroms, but the eight youth who won, especially for Wesley Winch, the Supreme Champion Showmanship winner. It kind of surprised me at first because it was, I don't know, I've never done that good in showmanship, honestly. And winning at World Day Expo is just, it's different. It's really exciting. The Ostrom family will dedicate more than $120,000 over the next decade. And Wesley, one of the first to receive the showmanship award in Annette's memory, is grateful. I'm very thankful because showmanship is something that sometimes get overlooked and something like that just encourages more kids to do it. Still in shock after winning, Wesley says Jim leaned over to say a few words. He told me that I'm never going to forget this and I believe he's right. It's once in a lifetime experience. An unforgettable memory in honor of a wife, mom, and avid dairy enthusiast whose second home was in the ring. And as their son Tristan showed this week in that same ring, you can see it's also where Tristan loves to be. Following in his mother's footsteps, whose tangible legacy is one that proves everyone can affect change simply by taking the first step and leading with kindness. Again, thank you to Jim for allowing us to share Annette's story, her passion she had for the dairy industry, and specifically for youth, truly is admirable. Well, when we come back, sometimes simple solutions aren't so simple. John Phipps explains in customer support. U.S. Farm Report, presented by Pioneer. What's next happens when the testing grounds meet the proving grounds. Pioneer, what's next happens here.
dairy industry, some producers have carved out a business selling directly to consumers. But it's a trend that isn't as easy as it looks. Here's John Phipps. Sometimes simple solutions really aren't so simple. My question is in view of the huge expense of farm machinery, herbicides, pesticides, fertilizers, etc. Wouldn't it be much more economical and safer for the environment to just let the plains region of our country go back to its natural state, plains, grasses, and so on, and raise buffalo, antelope, deer, and elk? The same farmers could, instead of growing cow food, raise buffalo and sell the meat directly to the consumer. No chemicals or exorbitant machinery expense, a few horses at Roundup time, and there you have it. And that's from Finn Larrigan in Arcata, I hope that's right, California. Thanks for your letter and for your address. Uh, now there's a lot to comment on in this here, but I want to focus on one tiny idea, a, a popular idea, at least in the media, of farmers selling directly to the consumer. My assumption was this business plan had been a slowly expanding concept, and the pandemic gave it a, a boost. Farmer direct selling has been tracked well, sporadically by the USDA for a while, and I discovered those assumptions were off base. We still don't have any good numbers from after 2020, so we don't know if farmer direct selling did see a significant rise, but direct farmer selling to consumers, restaurants, and institutions has been remarkably constant at about $9 billion a year since 2015 at least. This seems like a substantial market, but compared to total retail food sales of $810 billion, it's only about 1%. I think my misperception about the nature of direct selling business was skewed by the popularity of stories in ag and general media of mom and pop produce and meat stores. Readers and viewers love the images ad, but still drive down to Kroger to shop, it seems. Selling directly also requires either a very high value product like organic produce or unique cheeses to compete or reliable markets like restaurants. Direct selling requires other conditions as well. Proximity to population, enough labor to support reasonable store hours, and sufficient capital to keep going while business builds up to being profitable. Ideas like direct selling are of the same category of nostalgia that highlights what seems like simpler and better times, but ignores modern expectations of convenience and choice. While this business model can work, it does not seem to be growing much. Thanks, John. Well, when we come back, taking empty silos and other things on the farm and turning them into works of art. We're off to Michigan next. Well, driving across the countryside here in Wisconsin, you see signs of dairy farming everywhere you go. One of the biggest signs, those iconic silos. But for one artist, those silos aren't a sign of what was. Instead, they're blank canvases he wants to turn into works of art. As Farm Journal national videographer Russ Natusco shows us this weekend as he takes us to Edwardsburg, Michigan. We call this the all aboard mural. Murals are, are the thing now. Every little town has murals. And I just, I wanted the old depot painted somewhere in the village. So we had a picture of it. We wanted it to represent what the village would have looked like back then. The whole mural was funded by donations. You know, it was a nonprofit that put it together and they, they knew how to shake some trees and find some big donations. We believe that it is the largest mural in the state of Michigan. And the oddest one I've ever taken on with multiple buildings, but that was nine structures. Some of them curved, some not, some concrete blocks, some uh, ripped up weird metal. It was a working grain mill, though it wasn't during season, so there wasn't much going on there. This design is Brett's design. He wanted the buildings to look a little more old fashioned. The big train car with the silhouettes are actual silhouettes of village residents that paid to have their silhouettes put in the train car. Except for myself, I'm in there. There was just one left. <laughs> the one thing I like the most 
I would have to say the train engine. It's so big and you don't realize that from the road. It actually goes around the corner of the building. I design stuff on the spot. What if I put the front over here and the side down this way? I didn't know how that was going to look, but that ended up being like the showstopper piece of the whole mural. I love to paint bigger, weirder things, you know. <laughs> um, who knows, you know, I'd love to paint a, a whole factory, you know, giant square footage, you know, big outdoor thing. It is an incredible work of art. It brightens up the place. I mean, it's, it's so much brighter than just driving by a concrete mill. Now, Brett told Russ that he is up for a challenge. So anything big, he is up to painting. So if you have any ideas for him, just send those his way. Well, thank you for joining us for our coverage from World Dairy Expo this week. Next weekend, we're on the road. We're back on our College Roadshow, this time to South Dakota State University. So we hope that you join us next weekend as we work to build on our tradition. Have a great weekend, everyone. U.S. Farm Report is produced and distributed by Farm Journal Broadcast.